we want to work with uh, together and introduce to each other. Oh, sorry. Question: Do you mind if uh, do you guys mind if I record this? Because typically we work openly and publish our stuff on on YouTube. Do you can we do that or is this private? Uh, it's up to you guys. I don't. I don't have any concerns. At this, it's fine with me. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's really to get you three together to start formulating some ideas on how there can be some uh, cooperation. Uh, Joe Keel's going to join us here as well. He's a guy out of BNIM Architects that we mm -hmm. we work with quite a bit. Yeah, and he. He would be, um, you know, helping us to design interior the learning center. Um, so I think it would be uh, good to have him in, in these discussions as well. So, <clears throat> if hey, uh, ready. Good, good morning, good morning, Joe. Joe. Hey. So I think if we could um, again, kind of have everybody go through and, and kind of announce who they are and, and what their 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 goals are, um, and then we can start seeing some pass forward. So, uh, Jason, why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, Jason Sharp, I am Vice President of Academic Affairs for Lebec Community College. And uh, the goal for me is just to help supply workforce education to business and industry in our area or beyond, to be quite honest, we've got quite a reach. Okay, John. Sure, you want me to go into kind of a little bit of our background, what we're doing? Okay, yeah, please. Close here. Yeah. All right, great. So uh, my name is John McGilligan. I'm the CEO of York Exponential. So we began life as what's called a collaborative robotics company. So we focused on human-sized robots that are smaller, designed to work next to people, not replace them. Um, our big drive was making sure that people don't get left behind in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we live in a very small town. York, Pennsylvania used to be the capital of the United States, did a lot of amazing things. Um, but in the first Industrial Revolution, we did fantastic, like much of the United States. The second, we did great. And then the third, something happened where um, the people that started the companies passed it off to their kids, and our community went from being risk takers to caretakers. And so new technology was seen as a threat. And so instead of embracing it, it um, everything was about trying to maintain what you had. And you could see our town and towns across all the United States suffered. So uh, I, I have a, a long history, but I was ousted from my last a couple companies ago because of my stance on artificial intelligence for robotics and uh, being inclusive. And uh, we were a real estate development company, and a town seemed to really like us, but how many art galleries and brew pubs do you need? And so I started to talk about we need to provide jobs. AI and robotics was going to change the economy. People basically thought I'd lost my mind, so I was ousted from my company, and I went from being worth $5 million to 50000 in about five minutes. Um, I took that 50000 and for the next two years, traveled the United States because I was in a non-compete. I'd fallen in love with manufacturing. I realized that uh, robotics, a technology you could touch, could be very different. It could be way more inclusive because mm -hmm. we need PhDs all the way down to people that are good with their hands. So I believed robotics could be the first truly inclusive technology ecosystem, uh, what we're calling the world's first mech ecosystem. And that's, so that's really what we're pushing. Um, during those two years, I traveled all across the United States. I started to see that each town was almost identical. They had the same patriarchs, the same foundations, the same nonprofits. There was this algorithm that I was starting to pick up. And so my goal was to bring back a plan from World War II that came out of our town. Um, that ended up saving the whole of the United States. It's called the York Plan. I'll get into it maybe on another oh. call, or I'll send you guys a video on it. It's interesting. Um, and essentially, I came back to my town. I started my robotics company. I tried to convince my colleges uh, locally that artificial intelligence and robotics was coming. This was, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Again, everyone thought I was crazy, oh. and so out of pure frustration, um, I raised some funds and I started my own college. So we're the first licensed college all focused on artificial intelligence and robotics combined with traditional manufacturing skills like welding and fabrication. The goal is to create the first generation of robot mechanics. So middle class jobs. I'm not focused on entrepreneurship necessarily, not focused on startups. I actually believe there are more opportunities for entrepreneurs now in the fourth industrial revolution to start amazing companies. I'm not worried about entrepreneurs. I'm worried about everyone else. Like I saw what happened in the third industrial revolution and I'm seeing what's happening now. And you know, the price of, you know, mapping your genome is next to nothing. And entrepreneurs will always find a way. But regular people who are not equipped with this, the middle class, they're the ones that are gonna suffer the most. 
they'll also be the ones that we hit a tipping point that will eventually people will rise against robots. And I don't like the fact that there's just a few people controlling that technology. I think we need the first generation of responsible disruptors. And so that's what we've been focused on here in York. Um, so we started our school, we started York X. Um, we're also spearheading um, a larger innovation district, which Joe and his company's involved. Um, our governor gave us $6 million to start building in the center of our city. The pandemic stalled everything, which is why we're re refocusing. But its ultimate goal is to be the first innovation district where humans and robots will work side by side. So regular people will work in harmony with robotics. Um, during the pandemic, we ended up spinning off a couple separate companies just out of necessity. Um, we had a lot of employees. We raised a lot of money. We had a big R&D. But a couple pathways started to launch it, like become very clear. Um, so one of them was we landed a pharmaceutical company as a client before the pandemic. And it turns out they landed the vaccine contract. So we invented a robot that lives in a clean room that does personnel sampling using AI and computer vision. Um, so basically it does sampling with agar dishes on the fingers and the arms. And the way you control it is with sign language because you can't touch anything. So we ended up spinning off our software platform as a separate company called Metis, which its main goal, it's a, it's a robot agnostic um, control system. So it can control any kind of robot or device, but its main mission is to create harmony between humans, robots, and non-intelligent machines. So I think the future is gonna look not like the future, it's gonna look like now, but with robots. So we're gonna have non-autonomous vehicles driven by regular people, but those non-autonomous vehicles need to be able to communicate with autonomous vehicles. So we need to create this harmony of human non-intelligent machine and intelligent machine, because we believe that robots will be in the terrible twos for a while. Like, you know, they were infants before, now they're toddlers, and I don't know how long that's gonna be, but we shouldn't be trying to make super intelligent machines and then leave everyone behind. It should be more like the machines are taken care of by regular people and they learn from them. So we're trying to create um, this overlapping ecosystem and that's what Metis, our software platform does. Um, but we also spun off the whole separate company for Hygieia Robotics, which is in the life sciences. So that's main mission is to make sure we extend human life with the utilization of robotics and exponential technology. So we landed the largest pharmaceutical generic drug producer in the United States as our first client. So we're standing that up. Um, and then how I met Joe is through um, his partner. We have a project in Kansas City with the Goodwill there. Um, we created the first um, AI project for the Goodwills. So most people don't know this, but Goodwill's main mission is workforce development. They're the largest workforce provider in the world. And within 15 minutes of 85% of all Americans is a Goodwill. So we thought that they would be a perfect partner for us to make sure that no one gets left behind. So we actually did the first training of data annotation specialists. So we developed an AI that can identify type, brand, quality, consistency, and defects in clothing, which is a big problem for Goodwill. Um, we built the neural net, but we didn't train it. We taught Goodwill's employees to train it. So regular people were doing it, um, people with Down syndrome. Um, so we were intentionally inclusive. Wow. Um, out of that came a whole bunch of other stuff. But the main mission is um, we actually helped start what was called the Artemis Institute, which is Goodwill's first um, college focused on the fourth industrial revolution. Oh, wow. So I'm the vice chair of that organization oh. as well. Um, so that's our big mission. We, we don't want anyone to be left behind in the fourth industrial revolution. I don't want just a few people to control everything. And I think the mech ecosystem should not look like the tech ecosystem. It should be more diverse and inclusive with a focus on making sure no one gets left behind. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. Can I ask a quick question whether any of your stuff is open source? Um, parts of Metis is open source, yeah. So our software platform, there's portions of it that are. Um, and Gita can talk a little bit about our school and kind of its focus. Um, Gita, do you want to give a little bit of your background and you dive in? Yeah, sure, awesome. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Brad, I met you before. And uh, Marcin, it's great to see you. I watched your TED Talk on OSE, awesome. and it's really impressive. And also, the fact that you have a PhD in physics is pretty damn cool. So all right. <laughs> that's all. Um, yeah, so my name is Jita. You know, my background is in mechanical engineering with a master's degree there from Texas a &M. And um, so I, I grew up in the Middle East. I got my bachelor's there as well, but the Texas a branch campus there. And, uh, like, you know, throughout my educational history and career history, like, I've been very focused on, like, altruistic pursuits using my abilities on giving back to communities how I could help. So even back in Middle East, uh, one of the educational initiatives I was working on was how to transition the local students, the local Arab students, into the American curriculum. And uh, that was quite a challenge, but it was exciting in its own way. 
And then when I came over to U.S. while I was getting my master, what I noticed was, so my friend had gone to Germany, and w one of the things that was very contrasting was U.S. has the awesome academic research institutions like MIT, Carnegie Mellon, so near. But, you know, when it comes to vocational training, you know, like other countries, far surpass, especially Germany, and that's why their manufacturing is way more robust than ours. And so, well, that was one of the things that I was quite um, passionate about, and even I was writing a letter to the Vice Chancellor of the Engineering Department at Texas A&M, the need for more vocational training, and mm. how Texas A&M could lead on that, mm. because they have so so much resources, and also there is a need, even in the oil and gas sector. So while I was doing all of that, that's when I connected with John, and you know, John, I mentioned about vocational training, and John said, yeah, but we need vocational training in the fourth industrial revolution. And that's that was the point we connected in the space of robotics and AI in the space of machine learning. So after that, I came on board of uh, York Exponential. Um, so I started off, and then for a while, I led the research and development team, which is focused on developing uh, robotic solutions, uh, robotic software development. We developed our multi-robot robot agnostic control system. Uh, the whole point of this control system is how can we seamlessly connect various types of equipment, IOs, uh, robots, PLCs together, because often as integrators, uh, making things talk is an integration nightmare. And uh, now it's starting to pay off, especially with the Nephron, pro with the, pro the pharma pharmaceutical project, because we pulled up something that two other research institutions and three other integrators could not do. So that shows the power of the software. Uh, so I was leading the R&D project, a uh, couple of the R&D projects, and then I moved on to be full-time on the school, uh, the Fortress Academy, which John mentioned. The goal of the Fortress Academy is to build the first generation of robot technicians. And, uh, you know, currently we have partnership with Goodwill and other institutions to uh, promote this. So that's from my end. Yeah. Okay, hey, Marcin, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, John, awesome stuff. Uh, we talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. We've been running things like 3D printer build workshops. So we work on a much broader scale in terms of here's the open source blueprints for civilization kind of a thing. Please take a look at my TED talk if you haven't seen it. But the idea here is about public access to tech. Basically, we need to grow humans as much as we grow the technosphere to get a better world. So all that kind of stuff resonates. What I can bring to the table, perhaps, is uh, so Brad mentioned about getting curriculum on, say, 3D printing. Uh, yeah, we've been teaching workshops since 2016. We build our own 3D printers. Right now, we're s scaling up the larger printers that can print up to wall panels for the CD Home that we build. So we're releasing a product called the CD Home. Um, and automation is definitely like right now we've got an apprenticeship program on site we've got six people we see it's hard work we definitely see machines as integrated into that program from doing things like printing 3d panels recently we've been talking about okay how do you do a precise foundation just a standard concrete foundation that you can 3d print using a large axis robot kind of a thing so that kind of stuff we integrate the mechanical the software the cnc side uh, so we build things like tractors as well, uh, trying to integrate the large and small machines, so automation and larger mechanical machines using largely hydraulics, so the interface of those systems, and make it every, everything open source. So we talk a lot about, like Johnny's saying, don't worry about the entrepreneurs, but we're actually saying, well, let's make the entrepreneurs, uh, let's inject that kind of thinking of collaborative design into the world of entrepreneurship because I see that I mean entrepreneurs just running away um, and not really towards the ethical economy and so we talk a lot about the, right. the ethical economy open source is collaborative development and enterprise being spread far and wide to address the the masses that are left behind um, that's where we want to play so this is exciting to hear this and right now just a simple thing we could do right now would be say to prepare a curriculum uh, Johnny also talked about starting a school where we're working on that right now actually so getting certified to do tech school in 3d printing welding also the CD go home and then a larger like our vision here is to create land-based facilities that are a full university scale so <clears throat> pre pretty much like get yourself a phd in um, our organization is called open source ecology but it's really a get to that level of from high tech to low tech to to 
manual labor to PhD level work, the integration of all of that, uh, the kind of university curriculum that I wish I would have had when I was doing my stuff because the farther I went in school I felt more useless as I talked about in my TED talk. But uh, the idea there is to create a full campus that gives people that opportunity. And we're in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, so perfect place. We got to start right in our backyard, Maysville, Missouri, and go from there. So that's a brief intro. That's awesome. Yeah, and I don't want you to think I'm not, I'm not worried about helping the entrepreneurs. I'm just terrified because I saw what happened to people in my town that weren't the entrepreneurs. Yeah. And that's, you know, that growing wealth inequality. Um, I see that spiraling out of control if we don't make sure that regular people are included. Yeah, absolutely. Already kind of out of control, but it's going to get a lot worse. Yeah. So, Brad, where would you like this to go, this conversation? Well, oh, Joe, 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 you can try to introduce. We got to introduce yeah, so Joe. I'm, I'm, sit, I'm sitting in my car, uh, so <laughs> I apologize. I had uh, apparently our, our network at our, our office kind of uh, had a blip this morning, so I'm sitting outside. So, uh, no, this this sucks. I have to follow John and Marcin. So, uh, <laughs> John always John always gets me pumped up enough to where I need to like get ready to run through a brick wall just because I, I share a lot of his things. And and just for you, Marcin, and anybody else new, I'm a Southeast Kansas native, oh. and that's how Brad uh, Brad Reams and I got. Uh, hooked up together it was largely via mutual acquaintance and and me seeing some of the things that he was interested in doing in uh renewable energy out on the site and i've done a lot of work i I have a i have a deep passion for rural communities because i came up in a rural community as well i you know when i was sort of finding my path in design and architecture I, i was always a little bit mystified that i only was able to find one other designer and architect uh, in in like a, a 50 mile radius of, of myself. And so that was always a little bit weird. And he, he told me not to become an architect. <laughs> and so uh, so I didn't listen to him. Uh, and, and for that reason, um, when I when I struck out and, and started to become finding my education, I, I also had a there rural Kansas and Southeast Kansas in particular was going through a lot of transition through the 90s uh, into the 2000s, uh, whether it was from natural disasters or industry shutting down and packing up or changing uh, methodologies through those times. And so everything like railroad, agriculture, all of that. Um, and so in my in my mind, um, got to witness a lot of things happen in smaller communities that, that probably were good, but in, largely there were a lot of things that were not so good that were happening. And so when, when I got to know John, uh, and hearing some of the things that he talks about, just getting, making sure that regular people are really included in some of the things that are happening, um, in terms of the next industrial revolution, I really think it's important. My, also my background, um, has taken me in. So I've been a university professor at the university of Kansas. I I did that for about eight years, part-time, um, focus on design technologies, and sustainability uh, to be able to to really sort of look how communities as well as designs could be focused um, a little bit more uh, long term based upon doing some good things in terms of the environment as well as uh, making smarter buildings. Um, so I would say uh, when uh, we we also I mentioned natural disasters earlier, but. Um, a lot of the, the communities that we've interacted with in the rural uh, realm have, have uh, either been affected negatively by things like floods or tornadoes or, or even just, uh, you know, droughts, things like that, that, that we've tried to, to help mitigate some of the development, uh, everything from housing to, to higher education to education in general with the work that we're doing uh, in community development. So excited excited to be on here with everybody so, so you're a builder or what's what, what do you do so i'm an i'm an architect i'm actually a, uh, a partner uh with bnim architects here in kansas city missouri so apologize for not saying that no, but um yeah we do uh I, i've probably done more free work in rural communities than i've actually done paid work <laughs> just because it's so much more of a uh an interest to me uh the one other thing i was going to mention 
is uh, this this is where, and, and I don't even know if I've told John or Brad this before, but every time I go to a design uh, uh, conference or seminar or I speak somewhere uh, and I have, I have cohorts who are speaking out in the industry, there's a huge focus on major metropolitan areas or third world countries mm-hmm. that are really mm-hmm. struggling and not a focus in rural communities, which is really mystifies me and quite frankly, always pisses me off about our industry in the design and construction realm is because it's a one, it's a missed opportunity for betterment of, of the communities that, that help build and, and actually funnel people into different directions. And so that's, that's really why I think my direction has taken me into, you know, wanting to be a part of projects like this. So anyway, Joe, so I think next, next I'd like to come back at, sorry, Marcin, you had a question. Quick question for John, though, like, do, is there competition for you, i.e. is anyone talking the same language that you are that you know of, or are you very unique? Was that a question for me? Yeah. You said, Marcin? Yeah, John. Um, no, I've traveled all around the United States. My, I think my weird thing, it's, it's why I grew a beard. I drive a pickup truck now. Like, I was in a tech, I started a tech startup before. I lived very San Francisco, very Silicon Valley, and quite frankly, I hated the bro culture. Like I went out there and I couldn't stand it. And so when I came back to York and I tried to port that language over, nobody got it here either. Like no one could understand it. And I started to realize that I needed to model myself less after Mark Zuckerberg and more after Henry Ford. Like Henry Ford was like the the people's tycoon. And if you look at what he did, he did a lot of amazing things, created the middle class, made a lot of mistakes, right? And so what I'm trying to do is take the social impact thinking of like the mid 2000s married with if I knew if we knew everything that we did with that first generation of large industrialists so very often people ask what it's like being an entrepreneur and I tell people I'm not an entrepreneur I'm an industrialist and so my goal is I want to build industry and I but I want to do it learning all of the mistakes that were made from the first industrial revolution to now so as far as I can tell nobody's been focused on trying to create true inclusivity from the beginning Google, Facebook, they all knew what they were doing. They, yeah. You know, treating people as data points and now trying to flip it. I haven't seen anybody with that focus. Also, the idea mm-hmm. of making sure that everyone's included all the way down to people with disabilities, we're actually the only ones actually doing it. Yeah. Like, we're not talking about it. Like, I'm not an academic. I'm a practitioner. Um, and the flip side of this is I think the other weird thing is um, growing up, I lived in the United States when I was eight, but after that I was missionary. And my family traveled all over the world. So I think I got that evangelist bent from my dad. Mm -hmm. So I think that mixed with the tech side and then tied to like manufacturing and like hard technologies has probably given me maybe a different insight, especially because I traveled all across the United States to places like Joe's talking about. Like after I left York for those two years, I didn't go to the Valley. I didn't go to New York. I went to like Oshkosh, Wisconsin and Sheboygan and like all these little towns. And that's where I started to, to really start to understand the fear that people had and the fear that they didn't have that they should. And so we haven't been able to find anyone that's that has mm-hmm. this specific message. Um, we also have a very deep tie to history, which seems to resonate a lot with um, with folks across the United States and middle America. Does that answer your question? Oh, it does. So you're an industrial evangelist for the fourth world. Well, yeah, that's, that's the goal. I, I use, describing myself, I, I call it open source industrialist. Oh, I like yeah. that. Okay. That's it. <laughs> so I knew you guys hit it off. Um, but but what I'd like Jason to share now that he knows kind of uh, the people we're bringing to the table, um, some resources that they have. Um, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, putting in for the USDA grant that, you know, Joe and, and I would like to you know, obviously rehab this this army ammunition uh, headquarters, uh, base headquarters into a, you know, innovation center. Um, but I think Jason has some things they can offer. We talked about, um, you know, going after GI uh, bill recipients um, and teaching them. But I had a, a, a good enlightening after I talked to Jason about what they can offer and what they're already set up to do. So I want to have him share that with you guys so we can formulate the, the path forward. Go ahead, Jason. So uh, one of the things, it's interesting to, to listen to kind of the stories. Um, I, I think education as a whole kind of broke 
about 2000, and we focused on liberal degrees rather than workforce skills and soft skills and things of that nature. So what we've tried to really focus on is uh, filling that workforce gap based on the needs for that middle class and, and making sure that those jobs stay in rural America. Um, I don't know that uh, I mentioned I'm in southeast Kansas. We're in Parsons. So our town is, well, it was about 10,500. Uh, 2020 census rolled out. We're down to 9,600. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do is we've got a lot of um, collaboration with our, our business partners. And so Brad and I have talked quite a bit on how can we work together collaboratively to make sure that we have sustainability in our areas and continue to provide a good product. Um, we've been accredited for quite a while. Our institution started off in 1923. It's kind of grown since then. Um, we are an accredited institution. Our, our main focus has been health science. We've got very robust health science programs. In the last probably two to three years, we've morphed a little bit more into the manufacturing. We started a welding program about three years ago. Um, we also integrate that into our high school so that you get college credit while you're in high school so you don't have to duplicate uh, that coursework because really it's all kind of the same. And so if we can get you into the workforce a lot quicker um, through credit for prior learning, through um, integrating our college curriculum into the high schools and those types of things, uh, that really helps fill that gap before waiting for six years to, to actually get into a bachelor's degree or those types. We also are, uh, issue certificates. Um, so depending on kind of the level of what we're talking about, we refer to them as uh, stackable credentials. So you can earn a certificate that would go into an associate's degree, which the associate degree goes into a bachelor's degree, and it kind of stacks upon because not everybody's going to go out and get a bachelor's degree. Maybe they only want a, a certificate. For example, welding is probably our number one. We get a level one certificate. They're out in the workforce. They're making anywhere from 16 to $20 an hour. They can come back. They can get a level two certificate. It bumps them 20 $25 an hour. Um, and then it's up to them. Do they want to continue on and get an associate's degree? I mean, typically what we start seeing in business and industry is if you start getting promoted, that's kind of when those degrees come in. It's, you know, five years experience, an associate's degree, or those types of things. But being able to provide students an opportunity to step off at any point in time that they feel comfortable without having that whole traditional, you have to go for two years. We've also really dumped into our workforce education quite a bit um, and focused on areas of, for example, we have a huge fire science school uh, where they come through and we offer uh, like volunteer firefighters a reduced rate in fire science because they're in communities, they don't have big budgets, and, and how can we give back to those areas because they're providing community service that's it's high for those smaller rural areas. We've got a law enforcement seminar. We're working on some things with the Law Enforcement Institute that's here in Kansas. And so workforce-wise, we're really trying to integrate and expand on that. We currently have an infrastructure built in that we can do distance delivered courses as well. So depending on the setup and, and the requirement of it, we can offer, we're in part of what we refer to as NC Sarah. It's a national council for um, statewide articulation accreditation. So that whenever I offer a distance education class and uh, somebody from uh, Connecticut takes it, they know that that will be a an accredited course that could be applied at any institution um, that signs up for NC Sarah. Right now, the only institution that I'm aware of is California. They do not sign up for this. So they don't, they're not part of this articulation which basically just says you'll follow these best practices and rubrics. So we've got um, hybrid classes, we've got blended classes, we've got telecommunication classes, we've got distance delivered classes. So we've got a pretty strong uh, base foundation right now on how we can offer those classes. We've got internships, practicums. That's one of the other things that we like to do is partner and give that real world experience. If we can integrate them into the workforce and give credit for them as part of their college curriculum, we kind of intertwine all that together. So it's really just a matter of um, collaborating with the businesses, finding out and IDing what is their need, uh, and then from there trying to build a curriculum around it because I've got two different options. Option one could be an, an academic certificate or degree, and at that point I have to go through like the tech ed, I have to go through the state for approval, HLC, all the, the higher learning commission for the accredited side, or we can do it through workforce education as a certificate of completion. And so really the identifying what does a business need for their, their employees? And it gives us a little bit. That certificate of completion is a different avenue that we can go depending on that need. Um, but we've been pretty successful in getting it either way, just depending on what business industry partnerships look like. Yeah. Well, Brad, do you, want, um, do you want us to go over, I guess, the robot tech program? And Jason, you can tell us if you think that, that kind of lines up with what, Brad, you're hoping to go 
and maybe something that would work with you guys. Sure. Go, go ahead, Jay. You can go through. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, the Robotech program is like an accelerated vocational training program, which is lasting over 15 weeks. It's a very hands-on, hands-heavy program. And um, like we, we try to target people who already have some amount of mechanical aptitude or hands-on capabilities to uh, that would make a good fit for a robot technician. And in terms of the robot technician, broadly speaking, there are like four sections to it. Uh, the first section is mechanical light fabrication, so that includes your, you know, all sorts of light fabrication like, you know, drilling, tapping, deburring, cutting, uh, painting, spraying, those kind of things that you would need to assemble a robot itself. So that's your first section. Then the second section is uh, industrial, industrial electrical or industrial electronics. Uh, again, these are not high voltage but low voltage, like, you know, 120 volts or lower. Uh, so this includes like the various types of sensors, how to integrate them with the robot, you know, part present sensor or vision. a vision, some amount of vision. Again, like, you know, not the complex features, but just the easy features which the technicians can easily assemble. And that, that was also one of the reasons why we have the R&D team, so as to lower the barrier to entry to some of the complex technologies yeah. like vision. Yeah, we developed our own computer vision systems as well. So that was one of the reasons with Metis was to make very complex technologies, one, accessible, and two, when I was traveling, I was seeing all this cool tech coming out of San Francisco, but outdated tech out in the industry. And so we wanted to create this bridge that could take new cool stuff as soon as it came out and integrate it with as much ease of use as possible. And the pharmaceutical project we did, we actually did that with Google's media pipe. It's how we got the robot to be controlled with hand symbols and sign language. So that that's that was one of our big pushes, was how do we take advanced technology and make it easy enough for a robot technician to use. Do you focus yeah, so on, on sorry, question, do you focus on linear machines or arms, robot arms? Uh, it's a, well, so it's a combination typically, so depending on, well, do you want to dive in, Gita? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the training or us as a company? Uh, training. Go ahead. Yeah, training is the six axis arm right now, the articulated arm, which is the fourth section I'm getting into. Um, okay. So the second second, I'll just wrap up the second third, and then I'll get to the answer the fourth section. Sorry, yeah. So um, yeah, like you know, in the second section, the electronics, also like control panel building, all the wiring and all of that heavy lifting that you don't necessarily need an engineer to do once you have the electrical one. Mm -hmm. And then the third section is uh, the robot programming, and this one answering Marcin's question. You know, right now, we are focused very heavy on collaborative robots. You know, so small size human-sized robots, and these are six-axis articulated arm robots, and uh, we, in that section, what we generally do is first explain them, like, basics of programming, like, you know, basics, like, you know, if, else, for loop, while loop, so the basics, and then we kind of show them how these, and then we explain some robot-related programming concepts, like coordinate frames, and, you know, uh, drawing space, and tool center point space, and tool slant, and all of that. And then finally, we show them some code, uh, just enough so that they can troubleshoot. Because at the end of the day, the code is going to be designed by the design engineer, but we need somebody to troubleshoot it. We can't have the engineers always go to the customer side to look for something. So we, we prepare robot technicians to the level where they can look at a piece of code and quickly figure out where did the thing break. Yeah. And then the fourth part is, which is very essential, is safety. And this includes both personal safety, so PPE, and then also robot safety and machinery safety, which is, you know, like safety scanners and uh, light curtains and, you know, how to behave around robots and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, that's, so that's a high level view of it. Yeah. We designed the program with the assumption that technology will get cheaper, better, faster. So instead of us trying to, like, meet the delta that we have of PhDs, we think that is going to get smaller and smaller, that need. And robots may not replace, and AI may not replace everything, but it's stuffing into augment capabilities where you better be a lot better than everyone else. And also that one person is going to be able to do way, way, way more. And so, but we think there's going to be like this kind of inverse where it's going to go, you know, to, to have robots everywhere, they're not going to go viral, right? Like it, we're just in a different age. And so you need that rapidly upskilled generation that's motivated to be a part of something greater than themselves. But as you just said, with the basic mechanical capability, um, that then can, can continue to learn, which is kind of what you're talking about with the stackable credentials. Yeah. Well, and it, it's kind of interesting and, and exciting to hear because right now I've got a local high school that has a robotics program 
and we've been trying to figure out how we can maybe expand upon that or help them get college credit or uh, you know find career paths and then I've got another high school that has an electronics program uh, and they go over the basis of ACDC the small uh, circuits and you know they'll break down computers TVs and, and rebuild them type of thing um, so I think there's opportunity there we've got uh, just kind of brainstorming one of the one of the areas I think that we would struggle the most with is finding a credentialed faculty member but I would hope that maybe we could use somebody um, that has subject matter expert that uh, might be able to or willing to, to do the instruction uh, we've got space we've got technology to kind of lend towards that I've got a vacant right now a vacant electronics lab that's fully outfitted with little booths that has been sitting for about well, five, six years now that we've been trying to figure out how or what we could do with that. So even maybe a, and I don't know if, if you guys do this type of stuff, but even if I have an instructor that's based out of, uh, uh, well, York, for example, um, and they can Zoom link in, and even if the students are sitting in the classroom, you know, you talked about the hands-on, uh, there's there's ways that we can still have hands-on even with distance delivered so we can have everything in the lab setting the instructor can have everything at uh, their location and they can walk through and the student can repl replicate it on site it's not the best situation I mean ideally it would be nice to have the instructor morphed into that but it might be a starting point uh, or there might be other avenues that we could uh, kind of experiment with and, and take a look at how we can get that yeah something like that might work so we've actually been working we haven't launched it yet because we haven't had the need, but something called, it, it's basically like an oracle, but the idea is we've got all these retiring engineers that have all this knowledge, and when mm -hmm. they retire, engineers are different when they retire. They don't retire and play golf, they retire and tinker, yeah. so they like to continue to build things. Uh -huh. So we've got this massive gap of knowledge that's going to be lost, and so the, for us, the goal was we train robot techs, and then it's almost like an Uber for retired engineers that if you run into problems, you can just ping somebody, and they'll go in, so you'll always have access but then you continue to build mentors, like mentorship. So that was the idea that even with the students, maybe we could do something like that where they build uh, almost like your own advisory board. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have this mentor of engineers that are with you forever. And so that was kind of our goal was how do we connect? Because we know a lot of the folks retiring want to help. And Joe, you didn't know this, but um, we actually looked at the smaller lot in the Northwest Triangle of doing a retirement, like in a 50 plus, but it was focused on retired engineers. So that's yeah, actually that's cool. who we were going to recruit. Uh, was, that's cool. I wanted to build these everywhere, like in manufacturing communities, because you know there's the desire to go back downtown again. But the idea was to have this very high concentration of mechanical knowledge that would then want to volunteer within the community. And I thought that would be a way, like you know, when we talk about building an inclusive ecosystem, we needed to talk about age as well, because there's just especially when it's like mechanical things that and Gita, you talk about this all the time that you know there's this diminishing return when you know, in AI and robot or, or AI and machine learning, you want young, right? Like people right out of school, but with mechanical, there's just hard lessons you learn. So it's like this weird X and they're inverting. So we need those groups to live together and communicate with each other. This idea that we're gonna be fine because of the kids, bullshit. Like they're not tech savvy, they're tech slaves. Like the apps are using them. Like just because your grandkid keys an iPad does not mean we're gonna be fine. And so like this idea that the younger generation is going to solve this problem is nonsense. Like we need truly integrate, like if we're going to be inclusive, that needs to also include age, especially in, in the mechanical side. Go ahead, Brad. Well, I'm sorry to cut y'all, but we're about out of time because I'm, I'm on the freebie Zoom. I apologize, but um, I, I can send out another link and we can go for another 20 minutes if you have time uh, or we can reschedule for next week.